<laughs> All right, come on, we got a lot to talk about. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, oh, it is so good to be home. <laughs> it's so good to be home. All right, okay, okay. So, okay. Um, so I want to first of all thank all of the leaders who took this stage this afternoon before I came on stage. I want to thank you all for your leadership, for your support, for your service, for your dedication, for the partnership, um, we are very fortunate and very blessed in California for so many reasons. But we have extraordinary leaders, many of whom I've worked with over many years, who do their work in a way that is very personal about representing the people of our state and being a voice for those things that must be spoken and heard and being leaders for the most voiceless and vulnerable among them. And I'm honored to have you leaders with us with today. And I'm so honored to have your support. Can we please give it up for all of the folks that you have heard from this afternoon. So, well, we got a lot to talk about, okay. So as all of you know, we announced our campaign for President of the United States. And um, we announced in Oakland, the place of my birth, many weeks ago now. And, um, and I think many of you know I now live in Los Angeles. Um, I actually gave myself a name. Um, I decided that I am a Sangelino. <laughs> and it was wonderful though, and many of you were there with us in Oakland, where we brought together what we thought were gonna be a few thousand people and about 22,000 of our best friends showed up, so that was kinda nice. That was kinda nice. And as you all can imagine, a lot of folks have been asking, because we're still at the beginning of the campaign, so a lot of folks have been asking, you know, why are you running? Why are you running? And I tell them there are many reasons, many reasons. Um, one has to do with what I think we all know, which is that we are at an inflection moment in the history of our country. We are at a moment in time where we are each individually and collectively being required to look in a mirror and ask a question. That question being, who are we? And I think what we all know is part of the answer to that question is, we are better than this. So this then becomes a moment that we must fight for the best of who we are and fight we will. People ask me, why are you running? I say, well, you know, I believe that this is a moment in time where anyone who professes to be a leader has got to fight for the importance of restoring truth and justice in our country. <laughs> truth and justice. I believe this is a moment in time where anyone who professes to be a leader has got to fight for the importance of restoring equal opportunity for all people to succeed. And then there's kind of a personal reason I'm running, which is, you know, my sister Maya and I, we were raised by a mother who was all of five feet tall. Um, but if you had ever met our mother, you would have thought she was seven feet tall. And she was the kind of parent who, if you ever came home complaining about something, the first thing she'd do, she'd put her hand on her hip and she'd look at you and she'd say, well, what are you gonna do about it? 
So I decided to run for President of the United States. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. So let's talk for a moment about the importance of restoring truth and justice. So truth, you know, a lot of us have been talking over the last couple of years about the importance of truth in, in the context mostly of the many untruths we've been hearing, right? But I'd ask that we also think about the importance of truth in this context, which is, there are a lot of people in our country right now who rightly feel a great sense of distrust in their government, its institutions, and leaders. And the thing about a relationship of trust, we know it in our personal lives, we know it in our professional lives, the thing about a nature, the nature of a relationship of trust is that it is a reciprocal relationship, right? You give and you receive trust. Well, one of the most important ingredients in trust is truth. But, but, there's a funny thing about truth. Speaking truth can often make people quite uncomfortable. And for those of us who often speak behind a microphone or behind a podium, there's an incentive that when we speak, we'll engage in happy talk. We'll try to make everyone feel lovely. We'll sprinkle lovely dust all over the room and People will applaud and job will have been done. Well, speaking truth doesn't always accomplish that goal. But the other thing about speaking truth is this. Yes, people may walk away from that conversation thinking, you know, I didn't particularly like what I had to hear. But they will also walk away from that conversation knowing it was an honest conversation. So I believe this is a moment in time where leaders must speak truth. So now you all are looking at me. Okay, Kamala, what are some of the truths you have in mind? Well, I will share some with you. Let's speak truth. If Charlottesville didn't make it clear, if the Tree of Life Synagogue did not make it clear, if what recently happened in our backyard in Poway did not make it clear, racism, anti-Semitism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia, these issues are real in our country. They are born out of hate. Hate, which has recently received new fuel over these last two years. And we must all agree, wherever that hate displays itself, we must agree that we will speak out, that we will speak up, We must all agree. <laughs> and we must all agree. And we must all agree. We must all agree that whomever is the subject of that hate, should never be made to fight alone. Let's speak truth. Let's speak truth. 
America's economy is not working for working people. So how do we know that? Well, in our country today, almost half of American families cannot afford a $400 unexpected expense. In America today, in 99% of the counties in our country, if you are a minimum wage worker working full time, you cannot afford market rate for a one-bedroom apartment. In America last year, 12 million people took out a loan of on average $400 from the payday lender at an interest rate of often in excess of 300%. America is not working for working people. And I find it really interesting, guys. I find it really interesting. So then, you know, supposed leaders, they walk around talking about, oh, the economy is great. The economy is great, they say. And so, then you ask them, well, how so is this economy of yours doing so well? How might you be measuring this economy of yours? And they talk about the stock market. Well, that's fine if you own stocks. <laughs> then you ask, well, how else are you measuring this great economy of yours? And they talk about the unemployment numbers. Well, yeah, people are working. They're working two and three jobs to put food on the table. And let's be clear, in our America, nobody should have to work more than one job to put food on the table and have a roof over their head. And on the subject of the economy, let's also agree on this. When you lift up the economic status of women, you lift up the economic status of families and communities and all of society. But yet, in America today, women for the same work, for the equal work, on average make 80 cents on the dollar, black women make 61 cents on the dollar, Latinas make 53 cents on the dollar, and this has got to end. And it is an outrage. So tomorrow, I am going to announce the first ever national priority on closing that pay gap and holding, and holding corporations accountable for transparency and closing that gap. And you will see the announcement tomorrow. There will be penalties if they don't. Yeah. Gotta get it done. <laughs> Let's speak truth. Let's speak truth. We are a society that pretends to care about education but not so much the education of other people's children. Let's speak truth. So, I've been traveling our country. I cannot tell you the number of teachers I have met who are working two, sometimes three jobs to pay the bills. 94% of teachers in public schools in America are coming out of their own pocket to help pay for school supplies. <laughs> teachers make, on average, 11% less than similarly educated college professionals. And what we all know is that it is just a fact. There are two groups of people raising our children. Parents, often with the assistance of grandparents and aunties and uncles, 
and our teachers, yet we are not paying them their value. And you know, this is, this is personal for me. Um, my first grade teacher, Mrs. Frances Wilson, God rest her soul, attended my law school graduation. Yeah, but you know what? Many of us have a similar story of some teacher along the way who convinced us we were special. We weren't particularly special. <laughs> but they told us we were and we believed them, <laughs> which led us onto a path to being here together this afternoon, potentially making a decision about who might be the next president of the United States. So as president, I am prepared to close that teacher pay gap and in particular, to invest in our teachers by creating the first ever national priority around closing the teacher pay gap through a federal investment in our teachers. So nationally, nationally that number will be about $13,500 a year. Here in California, it'll be about $10,300 a year. So let's just put this in perspective. $10,300 a year, in most places in our state, represents a year's worth of mortgage payments. $10,300 a year, in most places in our state, represents a year's worth of groceries. $10,300 a year represents putting a significant dent in student loan debt, which is one of the greatest barriers to our students coming out and being able to join the teaching profession. And to put a fine point on this issue, I strongly believe that you can and must judge a society based on how it treats its children. And one of the greatest expressions of love that a society can extend toward its children is to invest in their education and by extension their teachers. Let's speak truth. And I'll tell you what else I plan to do as president on the issue of the economy. I am proposing that we change the tax code of the United States. And in particular, I am proposing that for families that make less than $10,000 a year, I mean $100,000 a year, because <laughs> that's a whole other plan, what we got to do there. For families that make less than $100,000 a year, I am proposing that we change the tax code such that those families will receive a tax credit of up to $6,000 a year, that you can receive it up to $500 a month, which will be all the difference between being able to get through the end of the month with dignity or not. And as you can imagine, then, when I announced my proposal, there were those who then said, well, how are you going to pay for that? <laughs> well, I will tell you how. On day one, we're going to repeal that tax bill that benefited the top 1% and the biggest corporations of our country. That's how we're going to pay for it. Let's speak truth. Let's speak truth that access to health care should be a right for everyone and not a privilege just of those who can afford it. Which is why I am supporting Medicare for all. And let's also speak truth that this past week made clear Women's access to reproductive health care is under attack. 
and we will not stand for it. And we will fight with everything we have. Let's speak truth. Let's speak truth that on any given weeknight in America, there are families that sit down to dinner during which the parents look at their children, elementary, middle, high school students, and ask them, darling, how was your day? To which those children respond, wasn't a good day. Why? What happened? Well, we had to have a drill where we learned about how we have to go and hide in a closet if there is a mass shooter roaming the hallways of our school. Why, Mommy and Daddy, or Mommy and Mommy, or Daddy and Daddy? <laughs> Why did we have to have that drill? To which, of course, the response is because there are supposed leaders in Washington, D.C. who have failed to have the courage to reject a false choice which suggests you're either in favor of the Second Amendment or you want to take everyone's guns away. Supposed leaders who have failed to have the courage to agree, fine if you want to go hunting, but we need reasonable gun safety laws in this country, including... <laughs> including universal background checks and a renewal of the assault weapons ban. <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you guys, I'm kind of done with this. Like, I'm just done. And you know, we've been working on it, many of us together for years. And you know, the thing is, on this subject, it's not like we're waiting for a tragedy to prompt action. We've seen the worst, the worst of human tragedies. It's not like, you know, are we waiting for a good idea? Nope. What we're waiting on is Congress to have the courage to act. So, when elected president, I will give the United States Congress 100 days to pull their act together. And if they do not put a bill on my desk for signature, I am pre prepared to take executive action. To put in place what will be the most comprehensive national background check requirement. Requiring that they will have to require anybody who sells more than five guns a year has to do a background check on the people they sell them to, requiring the ATF to take the licenses from anybody who, as a gun dealer, violates the law. And let me tell you something. 90% of the guns that are used in crime are sold by just 5% of the gun dealers. We need enforcement, and as far as I'm concerned, the ATF is doing just a fine job on the A and the T, but they need to do a lot more on the F. <laughs> the other executive action I'm prepared to take on this subject has to do with assault weapons in particular. There are four million assault weapons in our country that were imported from other countries. And I'm prepared to close that loophole by executive action. Let us be clear, one out of four police officers who is killed in the line of duty by gunfire is killed with an assault weapon, and we need a ban on importation of those weapons.
Let's speak truth. Let's speak truth. That our veterans sacrificed and were prepared to sacrifice everything they have, including their lives, for the sake of the protection of our democracy and our nation. And yet, we have an administration that is trying to goad Iran into war, but yet has not been dealing with the fact that we have 20 veterans a day who die from suicide, and they're trying to privatize the VA. And we will not stand for dishonoring our veterans in that way. Let's speak truth. On any given day in America, there are families who must sit down with their son, sometimes their daughter, when that child turns about 12 years old to have what's called the talk. Wherein those parents explain, son, you may be stopped, you may be arrested, you may be shot because of the color of your skin. And we have to agree that we have a criminal justice system that on this subject is in need of reform, has often been informed by bias, and can be fixed. Let's speak truth. Let's speak truth. Let's speak truth. Separating babies from their parents at the border is not border security. It is a human rights abuse that was committed by the United States government. And we need comprehensive immigration reform with a pathway towards citizenship in our country. Let's speak truth. Climate change is real. Yeah, but you know what? Isn't it kind of sad I had to say that? <laughs> so you all sent me to the United States Senate about two years ago. So let me tell you. So I was in a committee hearing. I was in a committee hearing. And um, the underlying premise of a topic in that hearing was to debate whether science should be the basis of public policy. This on a subject which represents an existential threat to who we are as a species, yet supposed leaders are pushing science fiction instead of science fact to our collective peril. And let's be clear about something, LA. If you can see out these windows, you see what color that sky is? It's blue. Anybody around here about two decades ago? Remember what that sky looked like? It wasn't blue. It wasn't blue. But what happened? Leaders led, recognizing that in large part, the threat to our climate is a result of human behaviors, which can be changed without much change to our lifestyle if there is leadership. We need a new leader. Let's speak truth. Russia interfered in the election of the President of the United States. Yet on this subject, we have a commander in chief who who, on this subject, prefers to take the word of the Russian president over the word of the American intelligence community. We have a commander-in-chief who prefers to take the word of a North Korean dictator over the word of the American intelligence community when it comes to an American student who was tortured and later died. We have a commander-in-chief 
who prefers to take the word of a Saudi prince over the word of the American intelligence community when it comes to a journalist who was assassinated, a journalist who had American credentials. We need a new commander in chief. I could go on and on with the truth, but it's a Sunday afternoon, and at some point I hope to cook family dinner for my family. Um, so I'm gonna end, I'm gonna end the truths with this one that I believe my friends and my neighbors that I believe at this moment in time is one of the most important truths that we can not only speak but that we must feel and know in our hearts and in our souls. And in particular at this moment in time where there are so many powerful forces that are trying to sow hate and division among us. And that truth is this. There is that truth. <laughs> on to the truth that I'm about to speak, which is the vast majority of us have so much more in common than what separates us. Let's know that truth and speak that truth. The vast majority of us have so much more in common than what separates us. And, and here's how I think about it. I think about it based on what I call the middle of the night thought. You know, some people refer to that as the three in the morning thought. Other people refer to that time as the witching hour. You know what I'm talking about, right? When you wake up in the middle of the night with that thought that's been weighing on you. Well, for the vast majority of us, when we wake up thinking that thought, it is never through the lens of the party with which we're registered to vote. For the vast majority of us, when we wake up thinking that thought, it is never through the lens of some simplistic demographic some pollster put us in. And for the vast majority of us, when we wake up thinking that thought, it usually has to do with one of just a very few things. Our personal health, the health of our children or our parents, for so many, can I get a job, keep a job, pay the bills by the end of the month, retire with dignity? For our students, can I pay off those student loans? For so many families in our country, can I help my family member get off their drug or opioid addiction? The vast majority of us have so much more in common than what separates us. And so I say, as we march toward 2020, Let's hold on to that. Let's claim that. Let's know that. And let's not buy what some people are trying to sell. When they're trying to convince us it's us versus them, because I'm not buying that. I'm not buying that. And I'm going to tell you else what I'm not buying. I'm not buying this conversation that's been happening recently about how, oh, you go to the Midwest, you need to have one conversation. You go to the South, you have a different conversation. If you go on the coast, you have a different conversation. I'm not buying that either. I'm not buying that. And I would also ask that as we march toward 2020, let's also remember one of the greatest strengths about who we are as a nation is that we, by our very nature, are aspirational. We are an aspirational nation. We are a nation that was founded on noble ideals, 
the ideals that were present when we wrote the Constitution of the United States and all of its amendments and the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights and those words we spoke in 1776, that we are all equal and should be treated that way, we are aspirational. We are also clear-eyed. We've not yet met those ideals. But the strength of who we are is we fight to get there. So this then becomes a fight that is born out of optimism. This is a fight that is born out of knowing what can be unburdened by what has been. This is a fight that is not only about the soul of our country, it is about love of country, and this is a fight we will win.